oh, okay, where are you? Let us know where you are with that beautiful weather. I am in Maine, which is in, I mean, I don't, I don't know where people watching are. So that's um, in the Northeast, in the Northeast part of the United States. Okay. And, and if I'm it's not- very, very, it's, it's, it's way up in the woods. It's a long way from any human being. If I'm not mistaken, you live on a hilltop? I, I do. I'm sorry, Thomas. I think I have a little bit of an echo. Do you live on a hilltop, you said? Yes. And does that impact your writing at all? Where you live or your view? How is the view there? <laughs> well, the view, I mean, I, I, it's very pretty. Um, it's, there are trees all around. So the, the, view, the view is sort of, um, the, my, the trees around my house are all birches. So they're, um, you, you know, beautiful white forest. Okay. Uh, there, there are rocks sticking up bear with the me one, Bear with me one second, because I think I'm having a little bit of audio trouble. Huh? I think I'm having like, um, let me just check on here. Give me one sec. Can you hear? Can you hear it like I can hear it or no? I, I hear you perfectly. Okay, I don't know why I hear that. So let's see what's going on with that. I don't know why that's happening. Okay, okay. So I'm so sorry that I interrupted what you were saying. So let's get back to the beautiful hilltop and how that impacts your writing. I suppose one way it impacts my writing is um, I write fantasy. So the, the yes. world the, and the world I, I set my stories in has a lot of woods and mountains and wild places. And um, so I have a research material readily to hand. Wow. Yeah. So And also it's just, you know, a good, it puts you in the right mood. For yes. Writing. So describe, describe your work area. Do you have an okay. office? Do you have a desk by the window? Well, I am, you are looking into my work area now. Oh, okay. I suppose that it would be um, in the interests of transparency and full disclosure, I, I should mention that I, I have racks of drawing laundry, which I moved out of the way. And okay. to, to, my, uh, to my right, I have a gas heater which um, is very nice to work by in the winter. It's sort of like, it's, it, it's, it's as cozy as a wood stove, but you don't have to chop wood for it. Oh, it sounds very nice. Yeah, and so then yeah, the window, what is the view outside? Oh, well, the, the um, feature of the view outside my window is my old well. And then, and then beyond that, they're pine trees. Oh, okay. And do you contribute, uh, do you have like a routine? Do you write for a certain amount of time every day? Do you even write every day? What's your writing routine? Well, um, <coughs> excuse me. I would, um, I would love to, um, I, I would love to, I would love to have a, a you know, a, a, a daily routine. Of course, the problem is that this is as, um, Former Secretary of Defense put it, stuff happens. Actually, <laughs> he, he didn't say stop, but you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe um, he used a different word. <laughs> he used a different word. But sort of my, uh, my template, but of what I try to make my days work out like is um, breakfast, coffee. I like to take some time after coffee. That's sort of a, a moment of contemplation for me. Uh, and um, th then I usually go for a walk. And, 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 and do some things around the house. By that time, I'm ready for lunch. So the, the day, even an ideal writing day actually does not start off with writing. But uh, all this is sort of moving me toward the point where I do sit down and turn on my computer and uh, you know, write for as long as I can. Right, right. And in an <laughs> ideal situation, I would you know, wrap, wrap up with a, you know, a satisfactory chunk of writing and uh, then, then you know, do some other you know, writing, writing related tasks, things related to book promotion and all. Uh, the, the reality is that, um, that that's really more than, more than you can fit into a waking day. So I, I, don't, I don't get it all done every day. And I'm that's sure. Possible. It's not, that, that's it, my vision. 
It sounds like a lot because then you also have to squeeze reading in there. Do you get to okay. read a lot? Uh, you know what, this is a good question because I ask a lot of authors the same question and it's either a yes or no answer. Did you read as a child? Were you a reader yes. in your youth? Yes. You were. So were you a big reader and what did you like to read? Um, of course, this depends on how, how far back you want, want to go. I, I, well, from I, whenever I was, you can remember, from whenever, as young as you can remember. Okay, I would, I, would, um, I would describe myself as a big reader. And if you, as literally as young as I can remember, um, my parents had accumulated, a, I, I don't even know, you know ba basically a collections, of children, a collections of children's books from um, sort of like, I would, I would say uh, at least the 1950s, maybe older than that. Oh, wow. But it was, it was this collection, it was an anthology. It's just all, you know, poems, um, you know, old, old, older stories, and and so and I had sort of this trove. And my mother, um, my mother uh, was very fond of poet. She she she, you know, wrote. She she, she was a published poet. Oh, and, um, really? She had a book which I do still have, um, which was you know favorite poems old and new. So those oh. poems were a big part of my. Very early. Sure. So Before writing is in time. writing is in your blood. More or less. My, my father, my father was an editor. So um Oh wow. Is that how they met in the business, in the writing business? Or I mean, we don't have to get into detail. I was just wondering if that's what brought them together. Well, that 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 I mean, you said we don't have to get into detail, but that, that question is actually a lot, a lot of my family history is contained within that question. Because a one-word answer would be yes, that is how they met. But um, the slightly, the slightly more detailed answer is that although my father was working as an editor, um, and that is how my mother met him, um, they weren't, they weren't really. This wasn't a publishing company. They they were working, they were working, they were they were working at the Martin Company, with an aircraft company. Because my, my mother, although my mother was a published poet, she um, her, her her day job was as an aeronautical engineer. Oh, wow, look at that. That's very, very interesting. I, I just wanna stop for one second to say hi to Suzanne. Suzanne says hello to us. So hi, Suzanne, thanks for joining us. So now yes. let me ask you this. When did you write your very first book or story? Unpublished, published, when was that? Um. Well, again, since you're saying very first, um, there were there were you know stories written on construction paper and illustrated with crayons pretty pretty far back. Wow, pretty early on. Did you spend a lot of time in the library? Yes. And are you a research person? Are you you know when you were younger? I know now because of your nonfiction books, research must have been involved. But when you were younger. Were you the type of person that liked to research things, look it up, get the facts? Well, uh, my, my father certainly encouraged, encouraged me to use the encyclopedia. He, he had a set of encyclopedias and you know, if anything came up in conversation, he would like, you know, ur ur urge, urge, urge me to look it up. So nice. I was conditioned to become a research person. Wow. And kind of conditioned to become a writer with your mom being a poet and your dad being an editor. And then also you had mentioned that when you were younger, your mom would read to you, correct? Your yeah. mom read to you a lot? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Your mom read to you a lot, right? When you were younger. Yes. So you were, you were surrounded with the books and you were surrounded by, you know, everything that had to do with writing. So I would say that had a huge impact on what you do now as an adult, correct? And then other than writing, what, what else do you do? I know you teach. Well, the, these days um, I write, I teach, I, I like try to keep, keep my place going. Um, and um, I'm, as, as I say, I do uh, I do sort of like make a point of, of, of keeping keeping my morning routine sort of you know quiet 
know, take, take, take some time, take, take some time for things. And uh, as, as we talked about, you know, reading, and I have to say, I, I, I'm in a phase where I'm watching a fair amount of Netflix. And this, again, at this particular moment in my life, these things are really sort of taking up, you know, more than 24 hours out of every day. Um, sort of throughout my life, I have been, uh, I've enjoyed astronomy. Um, I have, um, I have been, uh, you know, a, I, I've been, I've, I've enjoyed uh, role-playing games, which as, as we talked about yesterday, I've also, uh, you know, a, a lot, a lot of my writing career has, has revolved uh, around that. Give me the title. I, like I had mentioned yesterday, I'm not a gaming person. I mean, I was when I was younger, but it no way compares to the games of today and all the buttons on the controller and stuff like that. So give me an example of the type of game that I might know, you know, that's very maybe popular commercial. What, what would I know the name of a game perhaps? Yes. And by the way, um, I am, I am like, aware that this video gaming world exists, but none of the games I play involve controllers. There, there are people sitting around the table rolling dice. Oh, you know what? I watch a television show with my husband, The Big Bang Theory, and that's what they play. We love that show. That show is so good. And that's what they play. Oh, so yes, yeah, so everything, it's a board game, right? It's a board game. <laughs> Is that, am I using the correct term for that or no? Well, the, the audio, I couldn't quite hear what, it, oh, it might have been it, the correct term, but I couldn't hear it. Do you, is it considered a board game, Dungeons and Dragons, or no? Is there another term we could use for that? I think this is, this is, uh, this is what we academic people would call a liminal area. You know, it's between two things. Gotcha. I do, I, it, it's not wrong to call Dungeons and Dragons a board game. But when but I hear right. the word board game, I, I, I mean, I mean, but the, when, I, when I hear the word board game, I think of something like Monopoly. Right. Um, sort of a, a different, right. A different vibe to it. And let me ask you this: one a Dungeon and Dragons game, like how long can one game last? Like, how can this be days? Do you like leave everything set up and go back to it? Is it like something like that? It's it's something like that. It's so good. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's one of the reasons why I don't do as much of it anymore. Oh, sure, because it's very time consuming. Right? It's very time consuming. Yes, yes. So, and before, let, let's just briefly talk about that a little bit more, then I definitely want to talk about your books and your wonderful series. But as far as video games go, um, what did you start out playing before well, these uh, role playing games came out? Okay, you said. You said as far as video games go. Did, did yes. you mean video games? Yes, I as guess far as video games. In, in, in the 1980s, um, you know, I, I had like a, a cheaper version of the Atari. So like I, I did play, play like Pac-Man on, on my television oh. screen. But right. um, that, you know, that, that is, a, that has not, well, I mean, I, I enjoyed it at the time. I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not like anti-video games, but, but video right. games, I mean, Video games have not been a significant part of my life since. Gotcha. So it really doesn't compare. It's two different things. One video. So. Yeah, it's two different things. Okay. And you've written books, though, correct? On gaming? I, I have. And how many books do you have on gaming? You know, I would actually have to, like, dig out my, dig out my resume to figure it out. But um, ab about, about 19, sort of. That, wow. That, that range. When did you write your first gaming book? Like how many years oh. ago? Well, how old were you? Do you remember? Ah, uh, nineteen or twenty. Wow. It's. Um, I was writing articles. I, I, anyone out here who is themselves a gamer may, may have heard of Dragon Magazine, and I was writing articles for Dragon Magazine since I was about sixteen. But since you asked me specifically about books, I would I would say I was nineteen or twenty by the time I first I had my first actual, you know, old. Hold it, hold it in your hands. It looks like a book. Right, right. Okay. So, and then getting back to um, the fantasy books, when did you write your first book? I think I asked you before, but then we got sidetracked with something else. When did you write your first unpublished or published book? 
not when you were really young, when you said you had, you know, with the illustrations, but, you know, something more on a, you know, maybe on a more mature level or an older level? Oh, I wrote, uh, I wrote a, a novel manuscript um, in my late teens. And, um, it, no, and it, it never was published, as you were saying. Um, oddly, I, oddly, I had an agent, but, but, but it was never published. Um, so what that, that shows you, well, I mean, it's, I, was, I was about to make a cheap comment, but actually, I'm, I mean, the agent did a good job on that. Right. Well, sometimes, sometimes you can have everything and then it just doesn't, things just don't happen sometimes, yeah. right? You can have an agent, but it doesn't necessarily mean that what you're working on is going to go any further, I guess. Sometimes it's timing. I guess a lot of things are involved with that. So you're, so let me ask you this then. The very first book you published, was it self-published? And what well, was it? Okay, uh, the very first book that I published would have been one of the gaming books, and, and it, it was commercially published. Oh, so that was one of your first books. Oh, okay. The gaming, the gaming was sort of, the gaming was sort of the beginning of my my professional writing. Wow. Career. So what made you change? What made what did you move on to next? The fantasy or the nonfiction? The nonfiction. I I, I mean the not the nonfiction. Um, I was um, I was teaching at a university in England, and um, you know publishing publishing nonfiction books of research was uh, you know part of my day job. Oh wow, that's pretty interesting. So then, and then, how did you move on to fantasy? Oh well, I mean, basically because it's it's what I've always wanted to do. It's it's what I uh, um, it's sort of what where where I think I have something, you know, worth saying. Um, and uh, the it actually became practical in in two thousand two thousand seventeen, and then let's say two thousand eighteen. Because um, I had, uh, again, speaking of time, um, I was simply not going to be able to do anything, um, but but my day job while while, while I was an academic. It, it, it's very um, time consuming. consuming. Time consuming, I'm sure. And the and in in two thousand in two thousand sixteen, I, I I left that job and returned to America. And by and by by around 2018, I, I was living here on here on the, on the hilltop where I am now, and able to start doing um, some of the things that I considered important in my life. And and that's that's when uh, that's when that's when my first published fantasy novel came out. And what is the title? What's the title? Okay, the title of the title of the, the title of my of the first novel is The Witches of Granite Dale. And it is part of a series called Mara of the Lee. Okay. And how many books are in the series? There, there will be four. Three, three of them are now out. Okay. Do you have those books with you? Can we see the covers? Certainly. We'll see, see how see how well my camera does with the covers. But I'm I'm very I'm very happy with the covers. I, I, I was fortunate enough to meet a, a, an artist who, uh, who does a wonderful job and, 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 and a designer as well. The, the, the artist and the designer are different people. That's so really I, important. I, I, hope, I hope they look as good here as I think they look. I oh know. yeah, look at that. Hold it up, just, can you just hold it up a little bit? Move it up a little bit? No, not closer, but just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Up a little bit and maybe pull back a little bit, yeah. Oh wow! Yeah, very nice. Let's see the others. Let's see the others. Okay, this one, the, the next one, unfortunately, is my office copy, so it, it has an ugly line across the middle of it. Oh yeah, yeah, very nice cover. Sure, nice work. And that's your second book. And let's see, how about you? How about your third? Just going, just going to say, um, the artist Robin Burrell is a uh, Genius with color. I, I really. Um, she does. She does more than book covers. She has a web, she has a website. I really. Any any. any it, you know, it, it's worth checking out. Okay. And, and 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 I think sort of the 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 use of color is one of like a feature of her style. Yeah, I think that's very important because color attracts the eye. It's really lovely work. Very nice. Very nice. 
So I guess she will also be doing your fourth cover. I certainly hope so. Correct. So now tell us a little bit about your first book and what inspired you to write it and give us some, some history on that. Okay. Well, like, uh, like the other things we've been discussing, the history goes way back to the beginning of my history because one of the things that my mother, um, you know, did, did when I was, you know, re reading, re reading old children's literature is, she told me the, the Greek myth about uh, Cassandra, the, the princess in Troy, who told the Trojans, you know, when those Greeks bring that horse, uh, it's not a good thing. Don't, don't, let, don't take that horse into the city. I, I, I'm hoping people here like know the story. And, and Cassandra, you know, warned, warned the Trojans about this and uh, no one listened to her. And, um, you know, that, that, I think that story had a certain resonance with my mother um, and uh, it passed on to me. And I, I, I was intrigued by that. And, and when I got to the stage where I was, you know, starting, starting to think, you know, years down the line, when, when, I, when I started to think about writing in a, in a serious way, it struck me that it would be, it would be neat to write Cassandra's story and write, and write about, um, you know, how, how did she know? How, how did she see something that everyone else was missing? Uh, how to, how, and you know the, the king and then the king's warriors. Why, why weren't the king's warriors, um, you know, wor worried about the, their enemies sneaking in on the horse? Um, why, um, why, why, why did they miss it? And why did she see it? So I, I, I had this concept, and um, as I, as I myself started to study politics and war, because that 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 was my specialty. I, I, I as an academic, I studied international politics. Uh, one thing is I had a brilliant teacher. Um, and this brilliant teacher sort of like introduced me to um, uh, so some of the things that were going on uh, in the 1930s when Germany was arming. And a few people were warning that Germany was, was, was dangerous, but a lot of, a lot of people were um, you know, not taking it serious. So this sort of like fleshed out what, what a real life Cassandra might be like. And um, so, the, so what all this comes down to is the the uh, the, the, Mar the Mara series. I mean, it, it's I'm not it's not ancient Greece. I've made up my own world, my own people. And Mara is not a princess. She's just um, she her her father owns a farm. But um, <laughs> Mara is someone who um, you know looks looks at the world and asks you know what's really going on here. She's she's a very she thinks a lot. She's a very uh, introspective. Sort of person. And uh, The Witches of Chronic Dale is about Mara when she's 11 years old and she's first starting to notice that, you know, stuff is happening that the grown-ups really, the grown-ups really don't understand this either. Um, and, and so, the, and so it's, it's about, The Witches of Chronic Dale is about Mara. Um, well, she thinks, her, she thinks her country is about to be invaded. Um, and then when her when her own country's troops arrive, she thinks, you know, great, they're here to protect us, but they they they, they don't protect her at all. They arrest her aunt for witchcraft. So oh, most of the witches of Braddock Dale is primarily about Mara, you know, as a child, trying to rescue her aunt. Um, and as she tries to ask her rescue her aunt, she's asking, well, what's going on here? How come the people how come the people that were supposed to be on our side are 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 are, are hurting us? Wow. That is, that. that is so interesting. So that is three books so far. Well, The Witches of Chronic Dale, I, everything I've said so far is about the first book. It's about book one, but it's, we're spanning three books, correct? So, far. so that's so far. book one. So then give us a little bit about book two without giving too much away, I, I, if that's I, possible. It is, it's completely possible. Oh, good, okay. At, um, um, as I, as I say, book one uh, introduces Mara as a, as a uh, little girl, just figuring things out. And she's living at home with her family. A lot of the book is about, you know, Mara, like, you know, getting to know her parents a little better. Um, and um, and at, the end, at, at, at the end of book one, um, she goes away to boarding school. So book two returns to Mara's life um, about, you know, five years later. She, she's now 17. She's... Um, in in boarding school, she's 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 left the country. She's living in the, in in, a, in the capital city now, and uh, she's miserable. She uh, mm -hmm. uh, and she's uh, 
And her, her, there's this one friend that she has that sort of like keeps her going and her friend disappears. And people, you know, the, the, uh, the authorities, the, the, the teachers uh, say that her friend has committed suicide. Mara doesn't believe it. Mara really, really think, does not think her friend would have, would have killed herself. And so Mara gets together with some other girls from her school and they try to find her friend. And the sort of, that's the immediate plot of this book. And the sort of um, personal plot is that Mara has gone from being, as a little girl, Mara is just trying to make sense of things. Mm. And now Mara has been pulled out of the place where she, you know, understood, you know, where she felt comfortable with the people she knew her. And she's, she's sort of, a, she, she's trying to make sense of things again. And she's also sort of trying to establish herself, you know, who, who is she? What, um, she's, what, what what part of her is, is 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 going to stay the same now that she's in a completely different environment with completely different people? Right, right. It's so interesting. And then book three, can you tell us a little bit about that? Or no, I mean at some because I, I don't want you giving away the store here. <laughs> I, 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 I I I've got that covered. I hope. Um, and and um, book three pushes on through Mara's life because book two, I I. A second ago, I was talking about, about when she was in school, but actually book two carries on into when she's in her 20s and the process of sort of like, you know, figuring out who she is ends with her you know, li living independently in, in her own flat. And uh, this, this, this is not giving too, too much away. Uh, she, um, she becomes involved in spying. Now, and book three takes us farther into Mara's future and she is, um, she is, a, and, by, and by book three, she is 47 years old and she is very established. You know, I, I said in book two, she's sort of figuring out who she is. Uh, in book three, she's very settled in who she is. She's set in her ways um, and she is working, working a, a cover job as, um, as, a, as a censor, you know, you know, tell, telling people what they can and can't publish. And then, and then what she's really doing is um, she's running her country's spy, spy networks. And meanwhile, throughout all three of the books, there has been a sort of a, a large scale political plot in the background. Mara's country is involved in a, a sort of a cold war with, um, with, a, with another country called Juan. And this has been going on. I mean, everyone, everyone talks about, you know, Juan's the enemy, we, we hate Juan, that, that type of thing. But it's always been sort of in the background and there's sort of been the, been the understanding you know, war with Juan would mean the end of the world, effectively. I mean, I, the, uh, you know, war, war with Juan would be so terrible that we would never, you know, it would never actually happen. Um, and again, the, it, this is intentionally a parallel of um, what real life was like when I was growing up with the Soviet Union. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, the, um, and, the, um, and by book three, with Mara now working as a spy, now having access to the ruler of her country, she, she, advises, she advises the ruler, Mara starts starts sort of like starts to click with her that thing this big scale political thing is not necessarily go, going to go on the same way forever. You know the um, things uh, things are you know, we used to we used to think that that the actual war was was just unthinkable, but maybe it could really happen. Maybe maybe we're being maybe you know things are building up to the point where um, Juan could attack us. Um, and so Mara, Mara is, um, and so Mara is, is telling her ruler, you know, we we need to, um, you know, we need we need to act now, so uh, in, in in case in case Juan attacks, and uh, of course acting now means um, it, it, mean, it, it mean it means for instance mm -hmm. we we may we may need to fight a war we 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 may I, 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 so Mara is giving Mara is advocating some, some ideas that uh, actually she herself finds quite disturbing. And so uh, mm -hmm. getting back to the personal part, I, I mentioned that, you know, book, book one, she's sort of like, you know, encountering the world. Book two, she's sort of deciding who she is. In book three, she is settled into who she is, but now she's having to ask herself, you know, really, is, do I want to be the kind of person that is in favor of war? Um, do a um, do I am, I, am I living a good life? Do I have the right values? Um, right. Well, what, what is it about my, why, uh, my country is not that great. My country arrested by art for witchcraft. 
why would I why would I fight for this country? Or 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 would I fight for this country? Right. So will so, everything everything will wrap up, I guess, in book four. Four will be the final book. That is correct. And it will wrap up everything, all the questions and everything. Everything that's concerning her. How far are you into book four? I would say um I would say about at least a third of the way, maybe half the way. Depends on sort of like how how depends on how much on how much you, you, you know, how much I like the book when I read through it again. Right. Well, it sounds like a very interesting series. Do you um do you have do you give yourself a deadline? Did let me ask you this? Did you know originally uh, that you would be doing a four book series, or did it just happen to? flow into a four book series? What was the original, the original plan? Uh, well, s seriously, uh, when I, when I started, by the time I actually started writing, I knew it would be a four book series. I mean, it, you know, oh, wow. in, in 2008, in 2018, when, when I actually wrote The Witches of Granite Dale, um, I, I knew, I was pretty clear on how it was all going to go. Way back when I first had the idea, um, I, w I was thinking it would all be one book. One very long book, maybe. Yeah. Well, the thing is, <laughs> and here actually, um, if I could like take this and run with it for a minute, for, yeah, for, sure. Here's sort of like sort of my, my experience of the writing process. When I was, you know, you get beginning, begin, beginning to write professionally, you know, I, I you know tried to like learn about 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 the craft, as they say, and you know you you read books on writing advice, and you know, I, I took I, I studied at university. And um, I, I, got, I, I, I was sort of like imprinted with a lot of ideas of what, what you should do writing. And one, one thing I was sort of imprinted with is that uh, for some reason I had the idea that standalone books were considered better. I hear the opposite now. I hear that ser series are considered better. But at that phase of my life, I had the idea that, you know, real authors write standalone books. And uh, I also had drilled into me that, um, and correctly, the, a book needs to begin on an exciting note. You want readers to like pick up, you know, page page one, first line. You want to grab readers right there, and that's true, of course. Um, and I was sort of thrilled with the idea that the way you have to do this is, um, you you start you start the story in media res, as they say. You start somewhere in the middle of the story and and go back. Um, uh, but flashbacks are bad too, which is high school. What the heck? But anyway, um, I had the idea that if if I wanted to tell Mara's story, I would be expected to sort of start when um, sort of start in, in what book three is now, and then and then I would just have to like, and 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 as I tried to write that sort of like in my very early stages, I found out you know really to to write book three, I I needed book I needed books one and two, and fortunately. I had some. I had a friend who I, I showed him what I was trying to do, and he said, "You know, really, he was interested in Mara as a child. He wanted to hear about that." So, for, so I, I mean, I, I would say, fortunately, it kind of like dawned on me that I could forget about all the advice and um, tell tell the story that I actually had to tell. Right, right. So let me ask you this: If I picked up book two, would I have to read book one? Or if I picked up book three, would I have to read one or two or all of them? Like, would it be necessary or no, it would not be necessary. Do you recommend we read it as a series that we start from the very beginning? It would not be necessary. I have tried to explain things so that someone who, you know, is stuck, stuck at an airport and finds book two could, could, could pick it up and enjoy it. Um, however, I would say that if you have a choice, uh, I really would recommend reading the series in order. As I sort of have been talking about, a big part of the series is, um, you know, Mara, you know, Mara's character, Mara, Mara sort of like how Mara's, Mara's character develops. And I think that a lot of, a lot of the, you know, the, the, the stuff, the, a lot of the things about the series that I find really neat uh, 
come come from from you know seeing how she goes from being a child to being a teenager to being an adult. Right. Well, you know what it is because sometimes you never know how someone gets their hands on, let's say, one of your books that happens to be a book in the series. So, I, I mean, it sounds, it really sounds interesting. So I'm sure if they did pick up book three for some reason, maybe a friend said, hey, you got to read this. It's great. I'm sure book three would be so interesting that they would want to pick up book one and book two. I am honored to say so. And um, I can I can also I can say that at least one reviewer uh, did do that. Oh, see, yeah, I can I can definitely see that if it's interesting enough, people are definitely going to. And I'm sure it is. It sounds incredibly interesting. People are definitely going to want to pick up one and two. So now, how long did it take you to write your books? Your first book, your second book? Is it all about the same time? And how much time in between do you wait? before you start a new story. Yeah, um, it's taken me a moment. By the way, I'm hearing an echo. I hope you're not. Oh, I'm sorry. No. no it's not your fault. It's not your fault. I'm hearing, when I, when I speak, I'm hearing an echo. Maybe your, volume's a, maybe your volume's a little too high. Let me so see. That's what I happened can... to me. I had to lower my, I had to lower my volume before. Let me see if I can do something about that. Uh, while you work on the volume, I am just going to say hello to some people who have joined us. John. Hi, John. And John said that is a good question relating to a trilogy, thinking about Star Wars and how they were done in order. Thank you, John. We have Catherine. Catherine, we have, it says author's name and work. We have Thomas Kane with us today, and he is going to give us the title of his books again. We have Dawn, hi Dawn, and Anastasia, and Nick. And Nick is loving the interview. And he says, thank you for having it. Thank you for watching, Nick. We have Joe, hi Joe. Josephine, Josephine's hello, I'm late. Oh, that's okay, Josephine. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Bridget. Oh, we have some we have quite a few viewers here. We have Bridget. Hi, Bridget. We have Wanda. We have Heather. Oh, we have Jody, FK, and Gina says hi, all. Gina Solomon. And okay. All right, great. So, Thomas, I'm sorry. Um, just give us the titles of your books again. Catherine is asking about your work. Okay. The, the title of book one is the Witches of Granite Dale. And the title of book two is The Rebels of Care City. And the title of book three is The Hideous Garden. Okay, all right, great. And those are works, those are works, Catherine, by indie author Thomas Kane. So Thomas, this interested me. You did say um, you felt a lot of the 1980 era thrillers failed, hmm. right? Is that, is that something that you said how you feel? Is that something that you said? That is something that I said, yes. Okay, tell us why. I'm curious, I'd like to know. Okay, I guess, uh, of course, seriously, part of it is just that, that, that thrillers are a, a genre with its own conventions and it's not really, it's not really my thing. So to a certain extent, my criticizing the 1980s thrillers is sort of like those awful people that you, you get when you're an author that, you know, go, go on Amazon, they review your book, and they say, well, I never read fantasy, so one star. You know, if you never read fantasy, you know, don't review my book. Oh, um, okay. So it, it, to some extent, I'm, I'm, to some extent, the problem, the, the problem with 1980s era thrillers is just that they're written they're written for people who want one thing and I want another. But, um, and, and also of course, different ones are different. So what I say, I, I, I don't really mean, I don't wanna be unfair to any particular author. But with those, with those things out of the way, um, here, here are some of the things I'm talking about. You know, there's the, um, of course, in, in, in the 1980s, there, there was a, a, a pretty, pretty palpable sense that, um, there could be war between the, between the, the NATO countries and the Soviet Union. 
And um, a, lot of, a lot of these books came out sort of exploiting that. And um, they, um, the, when you read the book, you, know, you really get the sense. You, you know, when, I, when, I, when I picked up the book, I was thinking, wow, you know, okay, this is this World War III is um, going, going to be this huge human, human it's, going, it's going to come down like an ax to everybody's lives. It's going to be, um, it's, it's, going, it's going to be, um, there's going to be this huge human drama. And when I would pick up, you know, Red Storm Rising, the first thing is, you know, okay, I don't really sense any humanity at all in here. And um, I, ha I have no sense that, that normal, I, you know, what was it, you know, it, it was a lot, a lot easier to get through than COVID was. Um, and the, um, so the, the, first, the first thing is just that I, I think that these thrillers were, were missing the significance of um, what a, a major war possibly involving nuclear weapons would have been like. I, I would, I, I mean, I would compare them, for instance, I don't know if anyone is familiar with uh, uh, Herman, what, what's Herman, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the author's first name, but his last name is Woke, um, W-O-U-K. Uh, and and he, wrote, he wrote a series on World War II called The Winds of War. And that, that did get the human- I do remember that, yeah. Okay, that, that did touch on sort of how, how everybody's lives were disrupted. And I was looking for that in these thrillers and not getting it. And the second uh... thing is um, that despite the fact that these thrillers were presumably for people that you know, were interested in you know, what, what, what war would be like, they seemed very, sort of uh, sanitized. And by that, I, I don't mean that I want to like blood and guts. I don't particularly like reading gruesome stuff either. Um, but what I mean is that it was, it was sort of like, well, you know, okay, we have, we have this cool tank. And let, let me tell you about like the, the, side, the, 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 the neat electronics we have. On, this tank is really like neat. And, and we're gonna go out, you know, the Russians have some tanks, but they're not, their tank, the Russians are, the Russians are sort of like, they're, they're, they're Kind of like a joke anyway, but we're going to go out. We're going to like kick them off with our with the, our tank is going to like it's it's going to be scary because there's going to be a lot of them, but we're going to win. And I um have I mean, in my academic career, I did you know, I studied you know what what was what was going on in that period, and that is not what war with the Soviet Union was going to be like. Um, the uh, the uh, the uh, and it's not even just a matter of, of how, how much worse uh, a real war would have been. It's, it's a matter of, uh, you know, first of all, uh, I actually think the people writing these thrillers underrated how easily a war could have happened. How, how uh, you know, what the, 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 thing, the, things, the things that could have, could, could have motivated it. Um, people seem to think that, it, that, that, that there, there was no motive for for um, for for. Mm. So you feel there's some things missing. You feel there's some right. things and missing. In all, the... It would it would have been extremely unlikely that everyone would have just you know you know go, gone head to head with their tanks and and, ha, and had a had, had a had a big shootout. There there were um, um, if the the uh, the uh, and this is this is true in any you all in any war you try to get your enemy at a disadvantage. Particularly, I think, in this situation, the uh, Soviet military thought uh, revolved very, very much around um, what what today we would call preparation of the battlefield, but around you know making sure that the war takes place in circumstances where, um, yeah, the the uh, Americans may have a really cool tank, but uh, that really cool tank uh, is 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 is, there, is is going to be destroyed before it ever gets to the battlefield. Um, where uh, yeah you're you're ready you're ready to defend um, the the full de gap in Germany, but while the NATO forces are lining up at the full de gap, um, the, the uh, Russian forces are are coming around through Austria. Um, so I, I guess I don't I don't want to like I don't want to go on you know military. Well, you know military. what it is because you know you know a lot of the you know the details and you know from teaching and studying and writing the books that you have. The nonfiction books that you have, I guess you know where the writing does, you know, but I guess it's up to the writer. The writer chooses to write, write their story, but it just so happens with the background that you have, you find maybe some things that you're not happy with. Correct? Yeah. We could like put, we could like 
yeah, we can like call it that, right? Oh. Because, yeah, because of your background, which is, you know, pretty extensive. So there's things that you see maybe that could have been filled in that weren't. But getting back to fantasy, so now you're working on your fourth book, and when should we expect to see that? I'm hoping for the summer. It is, I mean, I'm at a stage in the writing process where, um, you, you know, giving a definite date feels scary, but um, it, it is on, it is on a a Amazon. I put it on pre-order at Amazon for, for the autumn. And, and I- Oh, okay. Uh, so it's available pre-order. That's great. It, it is. And it's, um, I am hoping to have, to have it, to have it, have it, uh, have it out, you know, in the summer. That is before the pre-order date. And I will just say this right now: if it is, um, it, I, I am, I am making progress. I am pushing. I am pushing through it. If, if you, there, there is, is no question that it's going to be out. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, as I said, I'm hoping for this summer. If, if, I, if it's not this summer, it will be soon. Right. It will not be much longer. And now, how do you feel about the series, the story? coming to an end, how does that make you feel? Is that a little bittersweet or is there more? It would be bittersweet, uh, except for the fact, as you say, there is more. Oh, okay, great. So tell us a little bit about that. How are you gonna work that? Okay, well, I have, I actually have a, a novel manuscript set in the same world, but with totally different characters that is, it, it's written. Um, it's, it's, I, I, it's really just a matter of, of you know, going going through it and uh, you know packaging it up, and that and so that book I will be putting that out um, soon after I finish the series. And what it's about is, it's um, it's it's about a a, a student a student study, studying studying magic at a, um, at a magic academy, and um, he finds out that he finds out that he's having he's like having some trouble with with, with, it, with he has a new teacher and the new teacher. Doesn't, doesn't want him to succeed. <clears throat> so he's sort of on the outs. And as he is contending with that, he gets to talking with one of the servants who, who works in the academy and, and finds out that the servant who has no training has made a discovery that will, will totally change the way everyone understands magic. And so it's, 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 about, um, it's about him you know, trying, trying to um, you know, save himself from this teacher and, you know, Tell everyone about what the servant has discovered, and, and um, the, the the sort of like a, the establishment doesn't doesn't want to hear it. Mm. So that, that is coming out, and then uh, in terms of writing, the the, um, the next book that I you know actually want to, you know, the next book that I that, that I will you know be, be working on um, will be will be uh, in 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 the Mara series. Mara's mother becomes a lawyer, and the um, and the uh, and I'm going. I'm going to write a story. I, I have. A, I have a novel concept about one of her cases. So it's about. It's about Mara's mother. Um, you know, defending defending on a, a, someone who was accused of murder. And uh, the, the title of it is going to be "The People versus Abigail Bennett." Oh wow! So those, are, those are going to be when when Mara series is complete. That's what's coming next. Okay, and that'll be another series. Well, these I, I, at this point, unless unless like I have. Ideas I haven't had yet. These will be two standalone books, but they will be um, they will be sort of in in the same universe as the Mara books. Okay, well that is something to look forward to. That's very very interesting. So right now, let's let everybody know where we can find your books. The uh, they're available on Amazon, and if you want to like see some, of, I I have a website. Which will have links, links to the, links to buy the books, and will also have you know some of the things I've said here, you know, written down. My my website is Thomas M. Kane, um, uh, uh, dot dot com. And I would also say if you're interested in, you know, up, updates on my writing and just and also if you're just interested in in getting you know some free short short stories from me, short well, it, more, it's more it's more essays than, 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 than fiction but if you're interested in like reading some of the things I write um, I have a free newsletter um, it's, it's called Matus. you can you can subscribe on my website and um, it's um, 
every, every month I talk a little bit about you know what what I see out my window in the woods. Yeah. And, um, I, ha I have little uh, I, I have articles and stories. What what I did in my last issue is is um, I'm writing sort of the, the story of the story of my life um, as experienced through drinking coffee. So I'm talking about you know moments in my life all featuring coffee that, that also sort of like where I learned something or where or where my life changed or where um, you know the coffee spilled on my lap. Or, right, uh, right. Or well, things to do with maybe being over caffeinated. <laughs> Which yes. a lot of us, I think we can yes. relate to being overcaffeinated. <laughs> but that's really, really great. And you have some wonderful books there. You have a wonderful series. And you have a lot of things coming out, coming up in the future. And after this interview, I will add all your links into the comment section. So guys, anyone who wants to check out Thomas's books, please go in the comments section and all the information will be there. I'll include the links and also for your newsletter and any other way that a reader or anyone is interested can find out more information. So that'll be really, really cool. And before we wrap it up, let me just ask you this. Is there something that you're thinking about writing in the future other than, you know, fantasy or gaming or right now you just have so much going on with that 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 you know you're going to be continuing to create stories in that fascinating world my the, my world is sort of where my heart is at, 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 at the moment and, and will be for some time because I, I mentioned the two books that i'm planning after this ser series but there are more. I just didn't, didn't think yeah. we want to talk forever. I'm sure. it's. It sounds like a really full world, and it sounds very interesting. So everybody, I recommend check out Thomas's links. I am going to add them in the comments. And Thomas, before we go, is there anything else you want to say? Thank and you very much for, for, for hosting me, and, and thank you to everyone who's welcome. listening. You're very welcome. It was a very interesting interview. And I'd like to thank everybody too. Thank you for tuning in. And don't forget to check out Thomas on Amazon. And like I said, I am going to add the links. And Thomas, you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Thank you. And we will see you on Amazon and around social media. You will. Yes, we will. All right. And everybody, thank you all for tuning in. Have a great rest of your day. Bye, everybody. Bye, Thomas. Okay, so I don't, I think we are done. Okay. Let me just make sure. Okay, it does say this video has ended. All right, let me just log off of here. Okay. All right. So how did it go? I I was happy. Oh, good. I think I think we covered everything. I do too. Right, I think we covered all the details. Okay, great. So thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I mean, you got a lot of work and um, it's very interesting and your series sounds phenomenal. So um, you're welcome. I'm gonna include those links and that way the viewers could check you out. So you. if there's any comments, just, you know, try to, uh, you know, and I will tip. All right. All right. And I'll see you around on uh, on social media. <laughs> you will. And if there's anything else you want me to add or anything like that to the links or anything, just just send me more. So basically, what you gave me, that's that's everything, right? Pretty much. I mean, it's with with social media, you you accumulate like mountains of things that you like logged on to once, but th those are the ones where I'm active. Those are problems. Let me just ask you this. I was going to mention it, but then I was afraid that I was wrong or thinking of something else. Is there something, the thing that you said with the coffee, that was Coffee House? Do you have something titled Coffee House? Yes. Um, the, uh, it is actually, I, I hope I didn't confuse anyone. I have a Facebook group called Kane's Coffee House. Um, okay. And then, I wanted to ask you about that, but then I got a little nervous that maybe I was, I was getting confused with what you were saying about drinking the coffee. But that's in your links, correct? Because that sounds appealing, Kane's Coffee House. I like the way that, you know, that sounds. And I would have liked to say it, but I just wanted to make sure, I, I didn't want to make a mistake, put it that way. So, but that link is included. So I'm going to add that to then. 
that. Um, I, awesome. Okay, great. Thomas, thank you again. It was a very interesting interview. I'm sure there's so much more that we could have talked about, but we only have an hour. But I think we covered all your books, and that's great. That is fantastic. I and really then next year, it. we could talk about the, the other books that you wrote that you're coming out with. How's that yeah, sound? I, I'm delighted. All right, great. All right, you take care and have a wonderful rest of your day and happy writing. And don't <laughs> drink too much caffeine. <laughs> All right, Thomas, I'll, I'll see you later. <laughs> see you later. All right, bye-bye.